Hello, and thank you for watching. You are watching the final lecture in my series of short uh, discussions of the Odyssey. This is on books 22 through 24, and again, this is Professor Ryan Paul of a m Kingsville. Book 22, Slaughter in the Hall. So this is our climactic battle scene. This is the moment where everything we've been waiting for, Odysseus is promised to get vengeance, all the wishes of Telemachus and Penelope and all the others who wished for the suitors to be punished for their deeds, this is where that's all f fulfilled. So all of the promise that the narrative, everything that the narrative has been promising us, um, finally comes to a head in this, in this book. And it shows Odysseus in all of his power, but also all of his brutality because he shows no mercy for any of those who he thinks have wronged him, anyone who's angered him, and that includes, in a very disturbing scene, the women servants. So let's just look at a few of the key moments in Book 22. The first victim of Odysseus's rage is Antinous, the most uh, reckless and criminal of the suitors. With that, he trained a stabbing arrow on Antinous, just lifting a gorgeous golden loving cup in his hands, just tilting the two-handled goblet back to his lips, about to drain the wine and slaughter the last thing on the suitor's mind. So notice how we see him just about to take a drink. It's just at his lips. The, the wine is about to pour into his mouth when he's killed by Antinous. And the, the irony, the tragic irony that Slaughter is the farthest thing from his mind at this moment of celebration, but he's about to be killed by Odysseus. But Odysseus aimed and shot Antinous square in the throat, and the point went stabbing clean through the soft neck and out, and off to the side he pitched. The cup dropped from his grasp as the shaft, shaft sank home, and the man's lifeblood came spurting from his nostrils thick red jets, a sudden thrust of his foot, he kicked away the table, food showered across the floor, the bread and meat soaked in a swirl of bloody filth. So again, the irony of the food that's covered now in blood, that he's about to take a drink of this dark wine, but instead his own blood comes spurting out. And we see just the moments, notice how Homer brings our attention to these very uh, uh, powerful details. The point stabbing through the soft neck, the kick of the foot, the table being knocked over, all these details that give us an almost cinematic experience of this violence that we um, have been waiting for. And when the suitors all yell at the stranger for murdering one of them in this palace, he announces himself, reveals his identity. You dogs, you never imagined I'd returned from Troy. So cocksure that you bled my house to death, ravished my serving women, wooed my wife behind my back while I was still alive. No fear of the gods who rule the skies up there. No fear that men's revenge might arrive someday. Now all your necks are in the noose your doom is sealed. So Odysseus places himself as in some way uh, avenging the wrongs they've done to him, but also avenging just their general sense of disregard, of disrespect for all that is right, all that is good, for the ways of the gods. And, and so they're going to pay for that. Recognizing Odysseus and his great anger, um, Eurymachus, who is one of the, the couple of good suitors that we've met, he begs Odysseus's pardon. Here he lies, quite dead, and he incited it all, Antinous. Look, the man who drove us all to crime. But now he's received the death that he deserved. So spare your own people. Later, we'll recoup your costs with a tax laid down upon the land, covering all we ate and drank inside your halls. And each of us here will pay full measure too. So he blames it on Antinous as he was the one who led us all to all the, the criminal acts that we did, all the greedy, selfish actions. But he's dead, so spare the rest of us and we will pay you back, right? We'll give you back the wealth that we took. But as you might expect, this is not good enough for Odysseus. He does not accept this uh, apology and the beg for forgiveness. He says they all are going to face him. So the battle rages on and we get a discussion, fairly lengthy discussion, of uh, how Odysseus, Telemachus, and the two loyal herdsmen take on the suitors. Um, and we also see the suitors fighting back 
aided by Melanthius, the treacherous goat herd. But Athena um, shows herself. She appears and she aids Odysseus, although not giving him insurmountable force. That is not making it easy for him. He still has to fight, but she aids Odysseus in the battle. And we see them go back and forth and how no matter what the, the no matter how the suitors try to organize themselves they still end up being defeated by uh, by Odysseus we have a second request for mercy this time by Leodes who is the the priest the prophet who served the suitors and he begs Odysseus for mercy i hug your knees Odysseus mercy spare my life Never, I swear, did I harass any woman in your house. Never a word, a gesture, nothing, no. I tried to restrain the suitors, whoever did such things. They wouldn't listen, keep their hands to themselves. So reckless, so they earn their shameful fate. But I was just their prophet, my hands are clean, and I'm to die their death? Look at the thanks I get for years of service. So he says, I didn't help them. In fact, I tried to stop them. I was just their prophet. I did nothing wrong. But to Odysseus, this is just as bad. A killing look and the wry soldier answered, Only a priest, a prophet for this mob, you say? How hard you must have prayed in my own house that the heady day of my return would never dawn. My dear wife would be yours, would bear your children. For that there's no escape from grueling death. You die. So even if he didn't take part in the suitors' activities, he prayed for their success. He served them. So the prophet must pay as well. And we get a third request for mercy, although sort of a third and a fourth, really. And this is from Phemius the Bard. And it starts off very similar to uh, what Leotis, the prophet's mercy, his request had started. Phemius the Bard says, I hug your knees, Odysseus, mercy, spare my life. What a grief it will be to you for all the years to come if you kill the singer now who sings for gods and men. I taught myself the craft, but a god has planted deep in my spirit all the paths of song, songs I'm fit to sing for you as for a god. Calm your bloodlust now, don't take my head. So Phemius, notice how he says, I am, I've been given this gift by the gods. So subtle suggestion there that perhaps by killing him, he would displease the gods. And he says, this is all I do is I sing. I haven't served them. They made me sing for them. So please don't kill me. And when Telemachus intervenes and says, hey, Phemius the Bard and the Herald Medon, they were, they were good guys. They didn't do anything wrong. They just served as they were ordered to serve, but they were not loyal to the suitors. This uh, moves Odysseus, and he spares the two servants. He says, okay, I will spare you. Neither of you will die because neither of you are guilty. Um, and he calls on Eurycleia, finally, to send him the disloyal maids. Which of the women slept with the suitors? And so Eurycleia says, I will send them down to you. And here we get some of the most disturbing moments, perhaps, in, in the poem, when Odysseus orders the death of these serving women. To Telemachus, he says, And once you've put the entire house in order, march the women out of the great hall, between the roundhouse and the courtyard's strong stockade, and hack them with your swords, slash out all their lives, blot out of their minds the joys of love they relished, under the suitors' bodies, rutting on the sly. So Odysseus feels they should be punished for their sexual indiscretions and for their pleasure at the, with the suitors. Of course, we might ask ourselves, how much choice would a servant woman really have had if some nobleman wants to take her to bed? Probably very little. So Odysseus's cruelty seems, from our perspective, um, well, his actions seem rather cruel, rather unfair. Um, and the poem certainly presents them as such, but we might ask ourselves, well, the culture that Homer's actually reflecting, would these women have truly been guilty or are they just being tarnished by their forced um, encounters with the suitors? Unless we think that Odysseus is just being uh, alone in his anger, Telemachus, his son, echoes the father's um, anger. 
No clean death for the likes of them, by God, not from me. They showered abuse on my head, my mother's too. You sluts, the suitors whores. So the women's heads were trapped in a line, nooses yanking their necks up one by one, so all might die a pitiful, ghastly death. So Telemachus blames it on the abuse they showered on him and his mother, that they did not serve as they should, that they were abusive to their masters. Uh, but regardless, he, but he also brings it back to their sexual indiscretions. Regardless, there is a, a certain disturbing cruelty here that I think even Homer and his audience would have acknowledged, but perhaps it's felt that this was necessary in order to put the house back in order, so to speak, to clean the influence of the suitors from the home. And there is the final cleansing as Odysseus burns fire and brimstone to clean out the house, the smell of death, the smell of debauchery, and the book 22 ends with him finally greeting his loyal servants um, as himself, as Odysseus. So questions to consider. How does Odysseus decide who gets mercy and who doesn't? If you look at the moments when he has his uh, encounters with the others who ask him for mercy, what is the What's the key in making his decision? Is there logic to it? Is there a reason behind it? Is it just his anger? Who deserves mercy in this book? Do any of the characters who die deserve mercy? Is there anyone who should be spared but isn't? And if you think that they should deserve mercy, why should they get this mercy? Is there textual evidence? That is, um, we could say from our own moral perspective that they all deserved mercy. Uh, maybe none of them should have been killed from modern morality, but based on the poem itself, is there any suggestion that some of the characters were maybe unfairly treated? And where do we see that? Or that Odysseus was unreasonable? And why do you think the Bard and the Herald are spared in particular? Think about what they do. The Herald gives announcements, brings news, whereas the Bard uh, sings stories inspired by the gods. Think about what's important, literally, but also symbolically, about the work of the bard and the herald, and why that might lead to them being spared by Odysseus. And uh, why does he kill the women? Again, to go back to the question just asked us a few slides ago, is this fair? Are they to blame for their sexual relationships with the suitors? Are they to blame for any abuse they might have given to Penelope or Telemachus, or even to Odysseus himself. Are they responsible for that? Should, should they be blamed for those, those signs of disloyalty? And finally, thinking about the violence in this book, why does Homer describe the violent deaths of the suitors in such detail? And we've seen that in, in other parts of this book. And if you ever read the Iliad, you'll see that there's excruciating detail of the violence. So what's the effect of that detail upon us as audiences? How does it compare to other uh, uh, extremely evocative descriptions that Homer has made. What's the purpose of this uh, poetic description of horrible violence? Book 23, The Great Rooted Bed. After the slaughter, Eurycleia is sent up to wake Penelope and tell her that her husband is here. But Penelope does not believe Eurycleia at first. She doesn't believe that it was her husband that's been here. She doesn't believe that her husband could have killed all of the suitors. To Eurycleia, she says, you know how welcome the sight of him would be to all in the house and to me most of all and the son we bore together. But the story can't be true, not as you tell it. No, it must be a god who's killed our brazen friends, up in arms at their outrage, heartbreaking crimes. Thanks to their reckless work, they die their deaths. Odysseus, far from Achaia now, he's lost all hope of coming home. He's lost and gone himself. So Penelope still thinks her husband is gone forever. She can't believe that it was he who came back to rid them of the suitors. But she comes down to see this man who has rid them of their uh, uh, pests. And she sees Odysseus and 
doesn't know what to do, doesn't know how to react to him. And Telemachus even says, mother, what are you doing? Just standing there staring. You should greet your husband, my father. And Penelope says, I'm stunned with wonder, powerless, cannot speak to him, ask him questions, look him in the eyes. But if he is truly Odysseus, home at last, make no mistake, we two will know each other even better. We two have secret signs known to us both, but hidden from the world. So this, again, I think a very beautiful, moving moment. We learn that this couple has a secret. They have something between them. Very realistic in a sense that the, those secrets that, that men and women or any couples have with each other that no one else knows. And it's through that secret connection that she will learn if this really is her husband. So she gives him her test. You look how well I know the way he looked setting sail from Ithaca years ago aboard the long-oared ship. Come, Eurycleia, move the sturdy bedstead out of our bridal chamber, that room the master built with his own hands. Take it out now, sturdy bed that it is, and spread it deep with fleece, blankets, and lustrous throws to keep him warm. So she says, you look a lot like my husband, but I'm not sure if you're him. So we'll give you the bed. I will take his bed out and let you sleep in it, but we will take it out of our bridal chamber. So you will not sleep in the bridal chamber with me. Odysseus, of course, passes the test. And the test is really to know the bed. He knows that it's too large to be moved by anyone else. And he talks in great detail about how he made it himself, how he designed it and cut it down and inlaid it with gold and silver. So he describes in detail the way the bed looks. And that is the secret sign that he knows, no one else knows all the, the ins and outs of their bed, so to speak. No one else knows how it was made, what it was made from, how it is engraved and so forth. So he passes the test by telling her uh, about the bed and she acknowledges and embraces her husband warmly with love, realizing this really is the man that I've been waiting for for 20 years. And as a couple who'd been apart for so long would naturally do, they are, they go to bed, they retire to their bed together. And they tell, uh, Odysseus tells Penelope of the last trial that he has to undergo, that Tiresias in the underworld told him, he has to go travel far away to a land uh, inland where they don't know the sea at all. They haven't heard of the sea. And they'll see him carrying an oar and they'll say, what is that? Is that something for, for, um, chopping down grain. And when he reaches this land where they don't know the ocean, they don't know the sea or anything of sailing, he is to make a sacrifice to Poseidon there. And so the two enjoy their marital reunion. They enjoy their pleasures of each other in bed um, and they share their tales. He tells her everything that's happened for the last 10 years, including apparently his time with Calypso and his time with Circe. And she tells him of, of all her uh, trials and tribulations with the suitors. So they have their evening reunion. And book 23 ends uh, with Odysseus planning the next morning, planning to recoup his losses. He says he will get it all back um, within time. And But he says to his wife, be careful because the suitors' families will want vengeance. So while I'm gone, you need to lock yourself up. Be careful about that. And in his last act in this book, in the poem at least, he sets off to see his father Laertes, who, as he knows, has been bowed down with grief ever since his son's departure. Just a couple of brief questions to consider. Why does Penelope not believe Eurycleia at first? And what does this show us about the depths of her despair, her attitude towards her lost husband, etc.? How does it compare to, for example, the, the behaviors of Eumaeus in previous books or Laertes, as we'll see in the final book of the poem? Um, and what does it say about the psychology of sadness and loss, how we behave as humans when, when we lose something or when we despair of ever regaining something or someone? And then considering the secret sign, and the secret sign is their bed and the designs on their bed, why is that the secret sign? Is there something particularly meaningful or symbolic about it being their, their bed in their bridal chamber? 
Just think about that as a symbol, as a metaphor, and what is communicated about their relationship through their mutual recognition of the bed. Finally, book 24, Peace. We begin down in the underworld again, and we see the Greek heroes that we'd seen earlier, Achilles, Ajax, Agamemnon. And Achilles and Agamemnon talk of their deaths and what had happened. Agamemnon talks about his tragic, inglorious murder. They talk about Achilles' glorious death on the battlefield and what happened. And this is an interesting moment because if you've read the Iliad, you know that Agamemnon and Achilles hate each other. Even though they're on the same side, they despise each other. It is Agamemnon that sets off Achilles' rage. So this talk in the underworld, they seem to be mostly made up, even though they are talking about the other person's death. But they seem to be getting along well. So an interesting moment to see that these two former uh, rivals have become friends in death, or at least polite to each other in death. Uh, and then we see the ghosts of the suitors arriving, newly arrived in the underworld to be greeted by the Greek heroes. And we have this brief little episode that, that I find just very amusing when Agamemnon recognizes one of the suitors, Amphimedon, who is his friend. They've known each other and he says, what happened to you? How did you all die? You're all great men. You're all great warriors. Did you die in battle? This is such a shame that you've all passed away. And Amphimedon says, well, it was Penelope and Odysseus. Odysseus killed us and he goes through the story of how Penelope tricked them and kept them at bay for so many years and set out the plan to have Odysseus slaughter them, etc., etc. And he's very upset about this. And then what I find very funny, Agamemnon, who again is his friend and who has just said, oh, hey, it's, I'm so sad to see you have died. How did it happen? After hearing this, Agamemnon says, well, great, that's good for Odysseus and Penelope. She's such a great wife to have. Um, so I find that just rather amusing that he tells this guy, oh, I, those people who killed you? Well, I'm, I'm, they're such great people. I'm glad about that. A little bit of humor, perhaps, near the end. Back in the Ithacan countryside, Odysseus arrives at his father's farm to find him alone, working the fields, planting a, a tree, and he is clad in filthy rags, in a patched, unseemly shirt, and round his shins he had some oxhide leggings strapped, patched too, to keep from getting scraped, and gloves on his hands to fight against the thorns, and on his head he wore a goatskin skull cap to cultivate his misery that much more. I'm not sure exactly why the goatskin skull cap cultivates his misery further. I haven't been able to find an answer to that. But the point here is that the father is literally on his hands and knees, digging in the dirt, and he is dressed in this filthy, unbecoming way. He's dressed like a man who doesn't care anymore, like a man who is sunk deep into despair. And Odysseus thinks for a moment about how he should approach his father. Should he be open and say, here I am, I've returned, or should he test his father? And he decides, once again, as we know Odysseus is prone to do, being a man of cunning, he decides to test his father in another scene that some have found unnecessarily cruel on Odysseus's part. So he approaches Laertes as a stranger and he says, excuse me, um, I, is this really Ithaca? Is that where I've landed? Uh, if so, I would like to find a man that I, that I once met and exchanged gifts with. He's the son of a man named Laertes, that is Odysseus himself. He says, I wish I'm looking to find a guy named Odysseus. In response, Laertes says, the land you've reached is the very one you're after, true, but it's in the grip of reckless, lawless men. And as for the gifts you showered on your guest, you gave them all for nothing. But if you'd found him alive here in Ithaca, he would have replied in kind with gift for gift. How many years ago did you host the man, that unfortunate guest of yours, my son? There was a son, or was he all a dream? So a, a rather poignant moment, heartbreaking moment, as the father who's been lost his son for so long and been living with the grief of his son's absence for so long, he even wonders briefly, 
was there ever really a son? Did I really have one? Or is it just a, a dream of happiness, a dream of a, of a noble son that I had that has been lost? It's almost as if the loss, the absence of his son is more real than his son was. So it's a very heartbreaking moment. And Odysseus tells his story, another concocted story about who he is. And notice the names he uses. Again, your translation might be slightly different, but in my translation, the names that Odysseus gives for where he's from and who he is, he says, I come from Romer town. My home's a famous place. My father is unsparing, son of old King Pain, and my name's Man of Strife. So these are allegorical names, much like the champions we saw earlier, Broad Sea and so forth. Um, I come from a town called Romer Town. I come from the place where people roam. I'm the, I've descended from the king of pain, and I am a man of strife. So it's both announcing who he is and that he's a, a warrior, a fighter, but also someone who has suffered and experienced a great deal of strife in his life. So he's sort of giving a little coded introduction. So even though it's a fake story, even though it's a lie, it has a truth to it as well. And when Laertes hears that it's been five years at least since um, since this man saw his son Odysseus, he falls once more into even further grief. And it's this that finally brings Odysseus um, to reveal himself. A black cloud of grief came shrouding over Laertes, both hands clawing the ground for dirt and grime. He poured it over his grizzled head, sobbing in spasms. That action of covering one's head with dirt is, uh, was a, a gesture in many uh, tri uh, traditional primitive societies for expressing um, uh, extreme grief, to cover your head with dirt. Odysseus's heart shuddered. A sudden twinge went shooting up through his nostrils, watching his dear father struggle. He sprang toward him, kissed him, hugged him, crying, Father, I am your son, myself, the man you're seeking, home after 20 years on native ground at last. And a very moving moment, he goes on, he says, look, this is the scar I received, or I can point out all the trees that you gave me when I was a child. So it's a, a very passionate, moving reunion of father and son as the, the grief of the father is finally lifted. So we have a family reunion. Laertes is restored to health. He is bathed, reclothed. Athena gives him back his beauty, and he feasts with his son and grandson. But there's another family reunion going on back in Ithaca, and that is the families of all the suitors are gathering their bodies out of the palace and mourning for their deaths. And one of them, Eupithes, the father of Antinous, who we remember was the worst of the suitors, gets the, uh, the rest of the crowd riled up and rallies them to avenge themselves upon Odysseus. He says, he killed our family, now we must take our vengeance on him. So this is, remember, what Odysseus had been afraid of, that once he got vengeance on the suitors, their families would want vengeance on him, which of course would then lead to whoever's left on his, his side wanting vengeance and back and forth. So we see the problem of the heroic code, the paradox, the contradiction at the heart of the heroic code of vengeance. When does it stop? Watching this, Athena asks Zeus if he's going to allow the bloodshed to continue or if he'll stop it. And Zeus says, you can do whatever you want. It's, this has all been your plan, but let me give you some advice. I recommend that you make peace between Odysseus and the other Ithacans. And so the final scene of the poem is this final battle, or almost battle. The Avengers all sweep, upon, sweep down upon Odysseus and his family at Laertes' farm. And so Odysseus and his men prepare for battle. And the last blow that struck is by Laertes, who throws his spear and kills Eupithes, the leader of the Avenger group. Kills it with him spear. Kills him with his spear. And right as battle is about to be engaged, Athena comes down and stops them from fighting. The Avengers all flee. Odysseus still enraged, but Athena says, "Stop! Stop! Do not! Do not battle! The fight is over." And so she issues peace, and it's with her 
order of piece that the poem ends. And Athena handed down her pacts of peace between both sides for all the years to come. The daughter of Zeus, whose shield is storm and thunder, yes, but the goddess still kept mentor's build and voice. So somewhat odd, perhaps maybe even anticlimactic ending. We don't know what these pacts of peace are or how they were enforced, but they held, apparently. We don't know why she does this in mentor's voice or why that's the last mentioned detail, but she did this in the appearance of a human. And so the gods give us peace, the god who started it all in some way, Athena, who started the whole Odysseus's whole journey, now becomes the one to ensure peace, to end the journey, to end the narrative on a note of completion and fulfillment. A few questions for you to consider. Why does Odysseus test his father? What is he hoping to find out? Or is this just Odysseus being Odysseus, being cunning and, and tricky the way he always is? Do you think this test is cruel? Should he have just gone and said, Father, I'm home? Or was it somehow necessary? Did he need to wake up Laertes in some sense, make him see his own grief in order to bring him out of that despair? The Avengers, the family of the suitors, do they have a right to vengeance against Odysseus? What is their right based on? Or why don't they have a right to that vengeance if you think they don't? Why does Athena have to step in to end the conflict? What does that mean? Both, both literally and symbolically. What does it suggest about the nature of war, the nature of violence and vengeance? And is it significant that the last lines of the poem tell us that Athena made the peace? Yes, but she did so in the figure of a human, in a human voice. What's meaningful about that last detail? Again, does that tell us anything about the role of vengeance, the role of violence, and war in human life, in human society, and the possibilities, if there are any, of getting past conflict, getting past war, living a life of peace. So some final questions, and there are a million different ones I can ask, but just a few final questions, thinking about the book as a whole. Does Odysseus develop as a character in this poem? Is he different at the end of the poem than he was at the beginning? And if so, how? Don't necessarily think there's a right answer to this. So I think you could make a good argument that he does change. You could make an equally good argument that he doesn't change. So you might think about what does it mean to you for a person to develop, to change as a character, as a person? In this poem, what do you think are the most important virtues and values that are promoted or developed or displayed in this poem? And why are they so important? Religiously speaking, ethically speaking, practically speaking, why is hospitality, for example, important both as a practical virtue, but also important as a social or political or philosophical virtue? At the same time, how does Homer critique or show the limits of those virtues and values? Are there limits to hospitality? Is there any time in which hospitality is not the right course? How does the first half of the poem differ from the second half? The first 12 books versus the second, you can think about, or any section, the first six books, from the next six, from the next six, from the next six. Are there any structural differences you can find in the different parts of the poem in terms of their style, their focus, the kind of events they talk about, the kind of characters they focus on, the types of themes that they develop. How important are the gods to this story and in what way are they important? Both again, literally as part of the narrative and figuratively as representatives of some larger idea or concept. And what attitudes towards the gods does this poem display? Is it always positive? Is it ever negative? Does it encourage us to be critical or skeptical towards the gods? Is it praise their virtue? Does it just present them as realities that we have to deal with? What's the attitude?
what elements in this poem, in this story, seem most influential to you? That is, in terms of being a part of later art. What aspects of it? Are there characters or character types? Are there aspects of the narrative structure, certain types of events, themes, etc., images? Any that have become familiar to you from movies that you've watched, other books or poems that you've read, any other types of stories, where do, how do they draw on the Odyssey? What elements from the Odyssey make their way into other stories? What elements in the story are the most troubling or strange or confusing from our modern perspective? And what about them is troubling, strange, or confusing? These can be things that we find morally or ethically troubling, like the slaughter of the maidservants, or things that just seem confusing in terms of their rituals. Uh, or strange, like the, the responsibility to give such lavish gifts. And again, think, why is it strange? Not just, well, because it's weird, because we don't do it, but what does that say about our culture versus theirs, about the different assumptions and understandings of the world that our culture, that we hold in our culture versus theirs? So what cultural, moral, ethical beliefs, what historical context or knowledge any ideas about ancient Greece that you need to keep in mind, that you need to be aware of in order to better understand this poem? That is, how do you keep from, another way to put this is, how do you keep from making modern assumptions about culture, about morals, ethics, about science? What do we have to set aside in our modern assumptions in order to better understand this poem on its own terms? How do we come to this poem and understand it as an ancient Greek would as opposed to understanding it as a 21st century American. How can we do that? So that is the end of the Odyssey. Uh, make sure you, rev you review the last books of the Odyssey. If you haven't already read them, read them again if you get the chance. The online quiz will be put up shortly. The online quiz on books 19 to 24. Uh, because of the delays this week, that's not going to be due until Saturday at midnight. And next week, we will begin our final text of the semester, Ovid's Metamorphoses. So next week, we'll be reading books 1 through 10. Uh, we'll have a quiz on books 1 through 5 on Wednesday and on the books 6 through 10 on Friday. And then we'll finish it up in our final week of class. If you have any questions, of course, you know how to contact me. Um, I look forward to hearing from you and have a great weekend.